Good evening. Okay, we're finally ready to go. I'm sorry for the delay, a little technical problems uh, to get started. And uh, so this evening uh, I'm going to do a presentation on, on net zero housing. And uh, Matthew will follow with the presentation on mechanical systems for energy efficient housing. Um, so I'm going to introduce some concepts to you that some of our, you may be familiar with. And uh, in our houses today, there, we have houses that are framed of the wood, uh, plywood, and things like that. And it's, uh, there's not a lot of thermal mass built into our buildings, our residence houses. They're very light construction. The thermal mass is usually in the foundations, like we have our foundation walls or concrete slabs, maybe a slab on grade. What the problem is is that we don't util utilize that thermal mass to its, to its optimum value. Um, where we, we have this concrete and it basically forms a foundation to hold the house up, but we, we don't uh, use it for energy storage. Um, a concept that has been around for quite a long time is that uh, you know solar energy, where people have uh, uh, walls that uh, will bring uh, windows that will bring a sun into a, a building and heat the, the floor of a building and store that energy. So. Um, that's a passive solar design that's been very popular and been around for quite a long time. Um, but unfortunately, in this region, we are living in a, an area where we have a lot of cloudy, cloud cover and rainy season, so we don't have a lot of sunlight. And so it's not as feasible to, to design a system like that in this region. It's unfortunate, but uh, that's what we have. But still, thermal mass could be used to store energy. And Matthew will talk a little bit about his seating systems, how we can actually take advantage of that. So I've got a presentation that we're going to talk about these concepts. Um, I work at uh, North Island College, and uh, I guess I, I have a passion for building science. I used to teach carpentry, but I used to teach at VIU, I used to teach in green building. And I'm really happy to announce that North Island College is, is going to be offering a sustainable construction program very soon. So we'll be developing a couple of online courses that uh, uh, will be offered to the public. Okay, so we have our existing houses that are basically not very energy efficient and, and don't take uh, consideration to disaster. Um, we live in an earthquake quake region here and also in the tsunami zone. And a lot of houses here are at risk. Uh, we're certainly the ones in the tsunami zone. So there are a lot of older structures, older buildings that uh, could be damaged in, uh, in, that, in those kind of situations. So what thermal mass gives you is I see a big wall of bricks there in the windows. Like I was telling you traditionally, the sun would heat that, that thermal mass. And uh, what thermal mass does, it stores energy and has there's a bit of a, a lag to it, what they call thermal inertia. These are scientific terms, and it's not too complicated, really. So what we have here is on the, on the left-hand side is basically your typical house. You, you're in the daytime, a little graph showing that it, 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 the, the, uh, the heating goes up, more energy is consumed, and then as it uh, cools down, uh, it goes down, so the temperature goes down, right? And then at night, we've got this opposite thing happening, the temperature is going down, and we will have to heat the house. So it's typically it rises, the house gets hot, warmer in the day, cooler at night. And on the right hand side is what typically happens when you have thermal mass in the house. So what we have is, is a bit of a lag that it stores energy. So as, let's say, as the, uh, as during the day as it's storing the energy, and at night, as it's cooling down, the energy is still stored inside the walls. And it would take eight hours. And in some really big buildings that are lots of mass, months, even seasonal, they'll just store that energy for a long, long time. So we can see that there's an advantage to doing that if we could capture that, uh, that energy. So the idea is here is uh, this is a, like a concrete, uh, uh, what they call insulated concrete forms. Uh, type of system where we have a con uh, insulated forms and we pour concrete inside. But the idea here is that the interior is the thermal mass. So what we do here is that 
uh, the inside of the room is on the right hand side. So as energy is lost to the outside, the there's a, an insulation that resists that energy going through the wall. So it actually stores in the wall for, for that time, like for eight hours or whatever. And then as it, uh, as it uh, cools down, the, the, there's enough in energy in the wall that's stored and then it's released back into the wall, and back into the room. So what we end up is, uh, with a, a wall that stores energy and releases it slowly back into the house. Um, what happens typically in a building like that is we end up with a, a very even heat. It's a you know, nice, normal, comfortable heat and it's consistent for longer periods of time. So that's kind of the physics behind what I'm talking about here. So what buildings typically do that? We are all maybe experienced living in a log house. If we ever lived in a log cabin, let's say you heated it up with a wood stove and you went out on your, your trap line for a day or two, you come back and it's still warm. It's because the wood has a lot of thermal mass and it stores that energy. And it also is a good insulator too, you know, depending on how thick the logs are, of course, and how tight the logs are, are fitting. So what I'm showing you here is a couple of log builders that are here on the island, like Dorsey Homes. They build massive homes out of logs and uh, Jefferson Log Cabins here on the island. So the same kind of concept happens with uh, log cabins. But not too many people want to live in a log cabin and it requires a lot of uh, skill to build such buildings. Um, here's some examples of natural building. I'm going to show you a few examples here. And what we see here is like your, uh, your earth ships on the, on the top corner there. That's uh, down in the New Mexico area. And uh, that kind of concept is using tires and pounding dirt into the tires. Apparently, uh, one of my students built a house like that in Powell River just recently. And uh, so it's a lot of thermal mass, but no insulation. So basically, it doesn't store any of that energy. So in a cold, heating climate, we've got a problem because it's not going to store that energy, it's going to lose energy. And if, it's, uh, if you have, let's say, weeks and weeks of cold weather, it's going to cost you so much to heat that and keep the, the, the energy up in the building and keep it warm, right? And the occupants always feel uncomfortable. And that's one of the big problems that has traditionally been problems with passive solar design. It's, it hasn't been that comfortable. Or it's too hot, or it's too cold, you know, things like that. So these uh, buildings have lots of thermal mass, but no insulation, and there's also a lot of problems with cold, building cold. Because uh, if you wanted to build something like this, you could, might be, get away with it to the uh, Lesquiti Island or something like that, where there's no regulation. But here, <coughs> you have to comply to codes. And uh, so some, they're right on the right hand side, it's cob, and then earth bag, different types of, in the cordwood, there's some of my students building a cob and cordwood uh, house on, at a farm. Then we have uh, some other ideas here, like straw bale. Straw bale is lovely, but it's unfortunately we, we live in an extremely humid climate here, so it's not feasible to, to build straw bales in this region. Uh, what will happen is moisture will be absorbed into that straw and start eventually to rot and mold and you're going to have a lot of problems. But I would not advise you to look at that. Uh, that's on the right hand side. The left hand side is, is actually a hemp house, a hemp bale house that a friend of mine built on uh, Salt Spring Island. And it's a lovely house, the same kind of a, a idea of hemp bale, but the drawbacks with that are it's very difficult to work with. Um, it's very um, fibrous and doesn't work like straw. It can't cut up the chainsaw, fouls up the saws, um, and the people that built it said they'd never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they have difficulty finding straw, because straw is not, there's not a lot of wheat farmers in this region, and they would have had to transport the straw from Alberta, and they said, well, that's crazy, you know, I want, we want to do something that's really green and sustainable. So they went with hemp bale, and, uh, but some interesting things with hemp, is that it's mold resistant. Okay, so it, it, it's got that disadvantage of straw that, uh, that we're uh, it's susceptible to mold, hemp's not a problem. And then on the bottom there is basically what the, some of the young people are doing is they're taking those bales 
and dipping it in clay. And what clay does, it renders the straw mold resistant and also fire resistant too. So it's a natural uh, method of construction. And uh, then there's another piece of uh, log type uh, method of uh, taking pieces of wood and writing them like a, a building blocks. And uh, those buildings, same with the log house, are very efficient and have lots of, lots of thermal mass. Uh, here's the insulated concrete form. Habitat for Humanity has built a lot of houses like this. They're actually in the process of building one in Courtney. And uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, these can go, these, these blocks could go below grade and above grade. And uh, you can build round buildings and things like that. They're styrofoam on the outside and inside, and you pour concrete in the inside. Um, a system that's been around quite a long time, but really hasn't caught on compared to other systems like uh, conventional framing systems. But uh, this is a lovely system because it stores energy and it also has lots of insulation. So it has those properties of thermal inertia that are, we want to have in our houses. This one, oh, I'm going to scoop up here. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, there it is. Duracell. Okay, this is a system that was developed uh, in Europe, but uh, it's available in Ontario. It's uh, been around for a long, long time. I actually renovated a house that had this in the foundation system, and all these blocks were exposed. It's a very unique uh, product. It's made out of wood fiber, waste wood. So your pine needle wood and all the milled scraps that we have, you mix that with cement. So it's a cementitious type of uh, product. And so it has cellulose in it, but concrete. So it's, in itself, it has some insulated value, but uh, and, and it has lots of thermal mass, so it can store that energy. And what a lovely product for this region. We could uh, make these things in mass. And it also has a mineral fiber, fiber insert. So a block like that would have an R value of R28. Pour concrete, and then we have lots of thermal mass, and you can cut it with a saw, amazing stuff. But another system that's never caught on too much in this region. Uh, another system here is ramp earth. It's, uh, this has been around for since the Romans, right? And uh, now this uh, system that we're showing here is a uh, is priority system that's developed in Salt Spring Island. Randy Bachman's got a house, a beautiful house in Salt Spring Island. He's got this contract to build this. If you go to their website, Sirewall, Basically, you can get all this uh, information about the system. And uh, my students have worked for them, done some work. It's, it's a great system. Ram dirt is basically you, you build formworks and you take dirt and you just ram it with a hydraulic uh, ram and it's compacted in and it has a huge amount of thermal mass. But what's uh, unique about this system is that there's insulation. It's like a sandwich system. So within the wall, there is uh, uh, insulation and he also adds cement to the, the soil to make it more resistant to erosion of uh, natural erosion. The right hand side is a, a typical ground earth wall but you can see how the surface has been eroded so that, that's one of the drawbacks. So this fellow in Salisbury Island is doing wonderful things. He's built uh, large commercial buildings and residences, uh, high-end buildings but they're very durable. This is, these are buildings that are going to last thousands of not uh, 20 or 30 like most of our houses. And now we're getting into some really interesting stuff. This is a house that was built in Gabriel Island using uh, straw and clay. And uh, this is what we call light clay wall. So we mix clay and straw in a concrete mixer or whatever wheelbarrow and we pack that in forms. I'll show you some pictures of that sun. This was done basically as a home, home, uh, owner build type uh, construction. This is what the person did it themselves. So she has an architectural background and she had a little bit of a disability but was able to build her own house. See? What's really nice about some of these systems is you can do it. You know, you know what to, it's possible to do. So here's uh, some little bit pictures of how the process works. All right? So on the right hand side, the top, you take the straw, you mix it with clay, and you get the consistency that when you squeeze the straw and the clay, a little bit of moisture just oozing out. Then you know that there's enough clay and the, the mix is right. It's not very scientific, but that's what it is. 
works just right. And uh, you know, we could get something very scientific and and, uh, and look at proportions and everything, but when you do do it that way, you know that you've got a good mix. So then, once you've got a good mix, you 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 place the the straw and the clay inside it forms. And you see it on the left hand side, there's plywood that's screwed to the surface of some studs. And uh, they take some two by fours and they sort of pack it into the walls. And then it sets up. And you can see on the right hand side, is after a couple hours, you can move that plywood over and uh, continue the process up the wall or to the next corner of the house. So it's uh, very, this can be done very rapidly and with very little skill, okay? Now the drawbacks here with the clay light fill is that um, it takes a long time to dry. We need uh, lots of hot, dry weather and that's a bit of a problem here. It's cool and, and damp. So it's a very small window of opportunity to put a, a, a wall up like this in this region. And this is an example of um, wood chip. So instead of straw, we could use wood chips, mix it with clay, and do the same thing. And we're doing things like this in, uh, in Cobble Hill, our, our village. There's a few projects that are going on in the island, and uh, it's been very popular. Um, but again, we need a lot of time for it to dry. So you see on the side, it's, it's basically you're building a very thick wall using two by fours with a kind of a truss. Um, so that's the wall system. And that was the, what they call a Larson truss. Uh, a, contractor in Alberta developed this system uh, in the 1970s and it became really popular. I've used this system to insulate super, uh, re residences and retrofit houses in the Northwest Territories, hundreds of houses using this method of adding more insulation but using fiberglass insulation. So that, that's what you see on the left hand side, the Larson trucks. So it just allows you to put more insulation in. Now here we get a little bit more radical. We're going to look at hemp, basically. Hemp as a product has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's the, well, the first Model T Ford car by Henry Ford was created. He, hemp, Henry Ford was a hemp farmer and basically designed a car that would run on hemp oil. And, uh, and it worked. But then big oil got a hold of the thing and changed it. And that's uh, clothing. This is hemp. You know, the best uh, natural fiber ropes were made out of hemp. Uh, the sails of the big tall ships that discovered our country here were made out of hemp. And so that's how we got here. But it's definitely something that we have a problem with is uh, the stigma around hemp because of, uh, it's used and abused by some. But uh, we've got uh, uh, an interesting product here. In Canada, it's legal to grow industrial hemp get a permit uh, to grow hemp uh, that was tried here in the island and unfortunately the, the contractor had so much trouble with people breaking into his and, and vandalizing his crops and so, so he quit unfortunately but down in Ontario it's a very popular product uh, we get a lot of uh, hemp seed and hemp oils that are they're good for cooking the hemp seed is a, a whole food very nutritious so when you have parts if you're feel like you need an energy boost, you take a little bit of a couple of tablespoons of hemp hearts and you feel like 100%. A very good energy booster, whole food. And it uh, provides fiber for, like I said, for clothing, uh, lots of uses. So this product, hemp shiv, or the hemp herds, is made from the core of the hemp stalk, right? The fiber is taken from the outside uh, layers of, of the hemp stock. And this stuff is packaged and actually comes from England, but it can, it's, it's distributed in the States. So we can get this stuff. And basically, we take the hemp herd, this core, and we mix it with a lime, a lime base. So it's, it's a, a system that's very formulated. So you just basically are baking a cake, you add a little bit of this hemp herd, a little bit of the lime, a little bit of water, and you, you've got this product. And it looks, there's the hemp stock. Okay. So what we're talking about where the herd comes is that center core. That's what we call the industrial byproduct of the processing. The, the fibers stuff on the outside is what we make clothes and, and things out of. So the, the, the stock is what, uh, it's a very 
little flake, a very flaky looking thing here. We can see a picture here. So what we do is we take the, the lime and the hemp herds, we put it in a mortar mixer, and it can be mixed up very rapidly. And it looks like what it, what it looks like uh, after you mix it up on the bottom there. And then we pack it into the forms, just like we did with the, the uh, light clay or light straw, okay? Uh, with a hammer, you see at the very bottom there, you're packing it in, right? So what we have here is a very high insulation value because it's cellulose. We have um, um, we have a lot of thermal mass. It's massive, and lime is a wonderful. Well, it's a wonderful product. It's been along for a long, long time. You know, the Egyptians were using them to build pyramids and things like that. But um, and there are some risks to working with lime. It could bur be burned, so you have to be careful when you're using this stuff. And we're using it some good safety. You see, that guy's got gloves on there to protect his hands. But um, what's wonderful about uh, lime is that it sequesters carbon. Okay, so we've got a product like hemp that actually grows like a weed. We don't have to basically fertilize it or do anything <coughs> to it. It's a grow like a weed, uh, six foot tall or whatever. We can use those products. Then we have the lime. Okay, the, the hemp is sequestered carbon as it grows. It stores that carbon, right? And then we have the lime. When you're processing the lime, you burn that. We have to heat it up to create the limestone from limestone. But then, as it cures, it calls, it creates a it's a chemical reaction called calcification, and that basically sequesters that carbon that's used to produce it about seventy percent. So we have a product that actually will take the carbon out of the atmosphere. So it's a very carbon neutral type product. And uh, what's another wonderful thing about it? It doesn't matter if it's wet. It's like concrete, it cures when it's damp. So we don't have to find the, uh, the right temperatures. It's, uh, it can be cool, it can be damp, and it's all right. So it's gonna be a wonderful product. So this is uh, what we're looking at. So same thing again, we take these forms, we pack the walls full of this stuff, and we get a wall that's higher, higher value, a very green product, a very low carbon footprint, very cost effective because it can be mixed up rapidly and high thermal inertia so that we can use that thermal mass and store that energy and uh, of course that's going to improve our comfort for the people inside the building and it's very airtight, uh, very airtight, very quiet uh, living space. So an interesting uh, environmental be benefits, there's a whole bunch of this in there basically it's biodegradable after its life. It can go back into the soil and no, doesn't have to go to the landfill, causes all kinds of problems and all kinds of things that I've talked about, it's carbon sequestering. The health benefits, of course, you're working with a natural product, there's no VOCs, uh, it's pesticides free, mold resistant, pest resistant, fire resistant, so it's got lots of pluses. And cost benefits, uh, here's a bunch listed here basically, uh, so that uh, it, it's a, a viable system that could be used in construction to build homes in this region and would work. And some performance benefits there. There's quite a lot of benefits to the system. Uh, the book on the right hand side is a book if you're interested in building with hemp. Uh, again, this is kind of like a owner built site type of uh, system. You could mix this up yourself in a backyard and hire a couple of guys to help you pack this into the walls and in a couple of days you'd have your house insulated. So, and my, while you're at it, you might as well put a green roof on your house because that makes sense. If you've done everything else right, you might as well do that and cut, uh, put a green roof because that would be the sustainable thing to do. Alright, so this so presentation will be on our the website so they can you can look at it and I have a couple of links so, to some other web pages there that I've developed on low energy housing projects. Um, for this town um, and their homestead, homestead school. And uh, now we'll have Matthew up. And so now that we built a uh, pump to get yourself set up, thanks. Now that we have a really energy efficient home that's uh, airtight, energy efficient, way, and we need a heating system and a ventilation system. Now, our houses, what we typically do is we put more heat in there. For cold, we'll turn up the heat, we'll put a 
bigger boiler in, and this is just insanity. We really have to, uh, you know, look, rethink the way we do things. So what Matthew's focusing is, is designing systems for these super energy efficient houses, because we have to think of how we do these things, because it's, it's not the kind of cases that we just turn up the heat and open the windows because it's too hot, right? Where, where, well,
harnessed or optimized from within our property line, right? So with this building, the property line, we need to take all of the energy for heating, for lighting, everything from within the property. That's, that's the definition of a um, net zero building. It's, you have a, a box or a cube and the energy you put in comes from within the box or, or what is shown you know, on, onto the box. So um, our objectives in all of this, and let me say um, I started a company called Humana Technologies um, because I wanted to see us as on aggregate use a lot less energy for energy, you know, so energy conservation. This is our best. This is our best, you know, form of new energy, and we all know that, you know. Um, the second thing is that if we're looking at a sort of holistic um, thing about indoor climate, then we're going to have we're going to be living in you know these wonderful spaces where we have we're very comfortable, but yet you know, um, we, it, in a way, what I'm trying to say is. Um, you know, we, we don't have very high standards about our living comfort, you know, because we have a thermostat on the wall and it's measuring air temperature, and it's not even doing that very well. So, we brought a whole new perspective to this, and we're looking at indoor climate. So, I want you all to remember indoor climate. <laughs> um, and the, the thing that really um, impressed me about the Baikal model is, wouldn't it be cool if we could have, we could build houses and structure the envelopes to support passive solar houses and when the sun shone on the, on the structure that we could move the heat to where we want. Um, well, we, I, I believe with Acumatic Technologies we've solved a lot of these problems. It's a kind of radical when so we you know, but it's very simple and it's tried and true and we've been doing it for thousands of years. But we, you know, we've got, we've got the advantage of having some, you know, very inexpensive technology to help us do the, the things that, you know, for example, you know, running a heating system manually. Imagine if you had a valve on the wall and you were going to adjust the valve and it was, you, you would sort of adjust the valve three or four times and then think, oh gosh, I don't want to adjust that valve anymore. So you leave it alone. Well, uh, if you have a cheap little processor, we're buying these four or five dollar processors that, that, go, that have turned that valve every 30 milliseconds. You know, well, why wouldn't you put the processor there? You know? And so that's, this is our kind of our perspective. And we're really keen on uh, optimizing. So if we have if we could have a perfect system, what would be some of the design premises? Well, um, a general manager, the GM guys, marketing guys, who I, I think are interested in making money rather than really making some inroads into, into energy, this guy says, if we can build a car that's cheap, and by the way is environmental, then we're on a winner. So you turn it around and you say, you look at all the technologies that, you know, all the things that wonderful people have done to get us to where we are technology wise. And we haven't, we're not really making inroads, are we? You know, we're not really getting where we need to be. So what we need for a system is to be able to. Um, so the system doesn't cost any more. It needs to be simple. It needs to be just what we need. No, no waste. No, and so it, things need to be carefully offered. A finesse proposition. How about that? Eh? A finesse. You know, uh, um, the trades. To, you know, the way we build our houses now is we come up and we go. Well, that house there. That's probably a four kilowatt house or an eight kilowatt house. Um, but to be on the safe side, we'll make it 10. I mean, I'm exaggerating a wee bit, but you get the idea. 
when, we, when we're dealing with energy conservation and finesse propositions, we don't have that margin. It just doesn't exist. So we have to do it in a smarter, cleverer way. And I believe this is what this technology approach is very good for. Um, so a, another really big issue has been, um, even with smart meters now, you know, we, we live in our house and every day we, we do what we do and we come back and at the end of two months we get a hydro bill. And we go, wow, that's high. Uh, wouldn't I like to be able to do something about that? And then we go to our one thermostat and think, oh, I better program that down. Well, we're not getting anywhere. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we're not getting anywhere. Um, what we need to do is imagine, well, I've got that room over there, and this one here, and this one here, and this one here. I don't use that one so much. Maybe I can set that one back. But maybe not just from a perspective of air temperature anymore, about human comfort. Well, why aren't we looking at humidity? Why aren't we looking at uh, airflow? Why aren't we looking at, at the radiant gain from the passive solar? Well, we need to. The second, the second aspect of it is um, that um, if, if we had some tools for people to be able to see what's going on on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, and I'm sorry, I apologise profusely to you those who are mobile phone access adverse, um, this might be a very good way of actually being, allowing us to see what goes on. And for those who don't, we can have technology, very inexpensive technology running it. Think of the effect that would have. It would be amazing. So, um, and then, um, so we've got We've got, um, this is all very nice for one house, but imagine if we had a, a, a building that's got multiple spaces, or we had a community, and we needed to share energy between the different, um, imagine if we could trade and share energy. Um, you, you know, uh, well I've got, you know, we're making a bit, uh, we can, we can uh, we have a solar array on the, on the roof, we can bring it down, we can store it, uh, we can modulate our thermal mass, as Guy is talking about. We can actually do this by having pipes and using water. Water is a fabulous heat transfer agent. And remember how I was talking about net zero? If we could look at places of having energy within our property line, and we can move heat around, then um, you know we could use it. You know we can store it. We can pump it into the ground. We can put it in tanks. We can do all sorts of things. But we, you know what? We need to have a way of figuring out where the energy is, how to uh, use it, and how to marshal it as a sort of finesse proposition. Um, mechanical design is, um, I, I personally believe, and actually this is where I was lecturing with Guy at Vancouver Island University, in, um, we have computers um, that allow, we can model buildings very accurately. But these are in the domain of very, you know, high-end mechanical firms. We need to bring these tools down to the average person. So imagine being able to build an app on your, your the, the layout of your house and watch how the airflow, watch the humidity, watch you know the, the radiant gain, figure out whether we're going to store it, and figure out. You, you see where I'm going? Yeah. Then the second thing is, and it just really troubles me, and I. Um, we go and we have all these building standards like LEED and everything else. What we really need, and this is really important, is we need to have a dual standard reporting. We need, when, once we've designed the house and we said, okay, the heat, our heat load is going to be this, we're going to modulate the 
humidity that. We're going to alter the thermal mass within the building by using a technique I'm going to show you in a second. Um, so um, we, need, we need to have a, uh, the computer to design what the building's going to do, and then once the building is built, we need to have a report um, to say we um, no, the, the building is actually performing to how it's designed. I just see so many times where you know we've got this building, it's lead standard, da 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 da. Um, and the actual what's happening is this, those buildings aren't anywhere near lead standard. If you actually went back and assessed them, and I can tell you, move, having just moved into a platinum lead building downtown Vancouver, um, I'm, you know, I, I think lead is wonderful, and I'm not criticising it. I'm just saying that it's it's making something okay that's not, and that's that's the problem. And what we need to do is have a second standard to say, yes, this building is doing as it's designed. And um, we can actually, we actually, if we had this, we, if we had a, maybe a little computer system with the sensors, we could actually test that data on an ongoing basis and you, you on the spot know whether it was happening or not. Now, um, so I, I've thrown a, quite a few concepts at you here. But just bear with me a little more. Um, this, um, can, I'm sorry, can, we have, this is um, this is one another really big area of high inefficiency. And so when you go to build a house, you want to look at the total amount. You know, and this is the definition of a net zero house. You want to look at the total input into the house. And and, and, you know, based on net zero, what we're doing is if we knew we had heat over here, we could move it over here and then use it for something else, right? Um, well, there's, there's a factory, which I won't tell you, I won't tell you who it is and where it is, but, and this is very common, trust me. Um, the, this is based on a factory um, where they have a high, they have a high heating need, and they have a high um, cooling need. So when they want to do the cooling, they have these great big refrigeration units on the roof, pulling the energy out and blasting it into the air. Then they want to go and sterilise whatever they want to do, and then they have these great big boilers, <laughs> and they're heating it up and it's effectively exhausting it into the air. You know, well, uh, hang on a minute, <laughs> you know, do we need a sanity check here or what, you know? Um, why don't we take the energy, and when we take it out of the cooler, stick it in the store, and then we can preheat the, the, for the sterilization, right? Well, the case where we're putting the energy in with the refrigeration units, um, and is we, what we call a load model. And a load model means when we, we have the energy to get what we want. When, we, um, when we, we take the energy and we move it and store it and then use it when we need it is a movement model. And movement models are, have staggering performance. Now you go, well what's this got to do with our house and residence? Trust me. What about when running a refrigerator? What about um, you know when you want to do heating and cooling and all sorts of fancy things? I'm, I'm going to get to that a bit further on. But so you're with me. The load model and the movement model. Please look at the movement model. <laughs> yeah. Now, okay. So we've got all these heat. You know, we've got all these heat reserves, if you like, and, uh, all around our, our property. So how do we get it moving around? It's actually very, very simple. If you need a small temperature change, 
you can use a, a very simple technique, what they call uh, passive distribution. And basically what that is, is that you put a flow of cooler water, um, say in, in a, it could be cross-link polyethylene pipe, and you can move the heat to where you want it. And the, if you need to get a higher gain for because you have domestic hot water or something, then you can put it in a heat, a water to water heat pump. Do never, never ever use air for moving heat. It's the third best natural insulator there is. Silica and vacuum are better. <coughs> right? So air, you know, when we have insulation in the house, the reason why it's in being an insulator is it's just little pockets of non-convecting air inside it. And that's why, you know, you know uh, that's what we're looking for when we have insulation. We need thermal mass to store the energy, but we need the air to, you know, to be stable and, and um, pocketed. Um, so, um, and, and in all this, I, mean, I know this is a really big field, that there's a lot to this. But, um, you know, in British Columbia, just to give you some idea, there are 4.8 million structures. 95% uh, of them are residences. Right? So, um, you know, so say, say we cut the energy of all the residences down by 75%. Say if somehow magically we were able to do that. Imagine the, the, the global effect that would have. You know, we would have energy for transportation. Um, so we've got to look at, and, and the second thing is that energy doesn't travel well. Neither does electricity, by the way. If you have two kilowatts at the dam, you get one out at the other end. You're going to lose one kilowatt. So there's a 50% efficiency. When you try to move heat locally, you have the same problem or a similar problem. So what you want to do is you want to have these little cells and you could maybe even link these little cells together. So we need to look at the idea of sharing and trading with each other. You know it would be good for all of us. You know. um, and we need to look at um, you know, tools to be able to store energy because you know, today, you know, it was a high sunshine day, we, we're getting a very high insult, you know, solar radiation for heating. But we don't need it for heating right now. We need it six months from now, you know, in the winter solstice. Um, so we're, we're kind of really like out of phase. Um, so there are techniques for storing it. And as Guy says, up to, you know, up to a full season and more. Actually, you know, some of the greenhouse guys, they just get the energy and they pump it straight in the ground. Um, they may lose a little, but they, they're getting, you know, when it comes to the winter months. And guess what they're using? They're using water to move it around. Anybody? Um, and I, I'm a very strong advocate. If you're doing put your solar panels in or solar evacuated tubes or whatever, don't use glycol. Just use water, and I can show you ways of doing that. And keep systems local. We need to bring things back to the community. And even smaller than cold sac then. You know, five houses, ten houses, five then. And and it'll be like a, you know, what is that? The tentacles sort of with the little cups, little cups on the frog's feet. I'm, I'm, you might not be with me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the, no, the idea is these little cups, you know, little collar sacks, and, and that's what it's going to look like. When Obama talks about a smart green network, I tell you what, I'll bet you anything you like that that's what it's going to look like. It's going to be these little district systems. I'll just quickly. I've already talked about human comfort, and I, I just want to be really quick about it. Um, we have, I've got four things, the four components of 
So ambient air temperature, it turns out, in terms of energy utilization, is only 27% of the total equation. So, hang on, we are heating our houses, pumping air in, it's half of it's going to the ceiling, or more than half of it's going to the ceiling, uh, and we're only controlling 27%. Uh, what's going on? Hello! <laughs> you know? um, and, and this is why when we look at radiant energy, when it falls on the house, it behaves like light, when it hits the window, it comes straight through. Don't listen to the window guys, they're telling you a whole lot of hooey. Um, it, radiant energy will go straight through like light. And the only way that you can keep radiant energy inside a space is using silver. Reflecting it back, like a mirror. You know, remember the little radi radiographers, we radio, what do they call them, radioscopes? You had it at the science lab at school, and one side was silver and one side was black, and it had little four little veins on it. You stuck it in the window and it went around. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That, that proves it. You, know. um, you can see, I, I'm a very strong advocate of using this high-end modeling software. You can see this picture to the, uh, to the right here is using three-dimensional images to see colors. And um, this one's particularly for ambient air, but you can also have it for radiant, you can have it for humidity, you can have it for airflow. I think this is where the future is. And that day thing, that uh, rose thing is um, kind of a performance thing of when you're going to be a net gain in energy time and when you need to take it from your store. I don't know if you've seen this, but this, is, this explains rain heat really well. This is kind of famous and I have to credit this this uh, diagram to a professor in Arizona. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but it's, I didn't do this. But it's excellent because you see, you've got these two vents here and here, and we've got temperatures all over the show. We've got 110 and down to 63 and then 95 at the top. When, when you have a radiant model, you have tubing through the floor. You, you'll have the temperature will be 81, sorry, Fahrenheit. Um, 60, 65 at your head here, and we don't really care. We, the lower the better above your head, because we don't live up there in the air. Um, but that, that is, it's very even, and you need, we need, want even comfort. Um, we want to, we actually use radiant for cooling as well. It's possible, well let me say that it's possible to do it. So you could, you could actually have a situation where, say you want to do chill your wine cellar or something, not something I'm particularly into, but um, say you have a wine cellar or a pantry, you wanted to keep it slightly cooler, or you wanted to modulate your thermal mass, you could use this water system to have each space at a different level. And if your house is leaking, if you've got a 1920s Victoria house, you put, put radiators in and you'll, I, I promise you, you'll have a much better result. Because it, it, it becomes less dependent on the airflow through the structure. You know, the windows are leaking and the, you know, the, the worst thing is usually the, the fan over the kitchen stove. Now, this is something that, um, I'm talking about natural systems, um, and we've actually, I built a house in the Nyman, well, I didn't build it, um, I was working with guys who have, and it has actually a little solar chimney on top of it. It's actually an air tower, and, and basically the idea is that when we get a draft, uh, we can move heat, uh, we can move air by creating a negative pressure, and so We've, we've uh, computer designed the house so the way the airflow comes up through the house, um, it'll, it'll draw the air up through the house. If, if things being designed. So we, we do have conventional ducting, but it looks different because we're bringing the air in from one place, we, we're 
we can dry it out by a few degrees. You, know, you always want the humidity about 50%. You want your airflow, well, there's government regulations about that, uh, they call it F326, um, which is um, 10 liters per second, say for a living area. Um, so, because we don't have sensors in every room, we can have sensors on the on the um, where we expel the air and where we bring it in, and we know and we know what the flow rate is through the house. Of course, when somebody opens the door, we notice the flow rate on the intake drops, so that's okay. But the air uptake still goes the same, so we know somebody's opened the door. You see what I mean? You know, we, we can do it as a sort of end-to-end -end flow type thing. This, this um, photograph here is actually in Dubai. And uh, there will be buildings in Turkey as well. And um, Egypt, where I've done, spent quite a bit of time, was um, they have these uh, towers where the heat draws the air up through. This, and with, there's two effects going on. The first one is the sun is radiating on the side of the tower. Notice the height of the tower. And then, and so it, it's causing the air to come back down like this. And then the second effect is the wind blows past it, creating a negative pressure which draws the air up through. Right? So, on, and now this is the house in John's Avenue. This literally is the house in and you can see the solar chimney on the top with the wind blowing past it. And we draw the air in through well, the mechanical area and we can control the humidity. Yeah. Um, and for backup, you know, because it's not always windy, right? So what we have is we, our system controls the bathroom fans and we can get additional, we can turn on the bathroom fans to get what we want. But actually, in terms of when it comes to, with respect to the building code, um, the fans are going way, way too much, like a factor of five or six. And so actually, we, we sort of cut it back a lot. So, um, and, and what I really wanted to show with these natural systems are, and, and he was sort of alluding to it before was, you know, we can have natural air, we can have somewhat, we have natural humidity modulation. There's a very famous castle in Spain called the Lumbra, where they have these fountains where they're jetting the water like this. Well, they're running in tangent with that wind tower, and what's actually happening is that the draft's running along those water things and then up the wind tower. And it's actually changing the humidity, remember the, the, the four things I talked about? Um, it's changing the humidity and the airflow. Cool, you know that's you know I mean literally <laughs> um, that's you know that's those are natural systems. Why are we spending all this on this other? <laughs> this is um, actually I just wanted to quickly show you this. This is actually a computer analysis of um, of, of this building. You can see here are the windows. When it's white, it's perfect. And here's the solar chimney right there, and, and the windows. And you can see it's slightly falling off. It's only about a degree we've lost. But this is not usable space, it's a stairwell. And anyway, you're, you, know, you come up to here and up to here, so you, you know, you're actually walking, you know, your exposure to the slightly cooler air you know, in winter it is so small that it's negligible. So this is this is a fantastic technique, you know. The other one of the other design premises that we had to have was, like I said, we have 4.8 million buildings in British Columbia. They ain't going to be knocked down, and they, you know, we need to keep them for a while. So we need to have a strategy. That works both for high performance homes on the right, and and in fact we have we've got a perfect solution for both of them. Now I'm, I'm going to talk about that just very quickly in a bit. So what the point is that we need to have two different strategies. 
right? One for renovation, one for new high, ball, high performance buildings. These are some projects that I've been working on for about 10 years. And I'm very, I'm very particular about how I like things, you know. Um, you can see we've got a lot of copper work here. This was actually um, down in the US, actually. Um, this is our control system here. Um, so over this 10 years, I've been using these different components, and I was getting really quite frustrated, but not being able to put a control system together. And I went out to try and, you know, I've been trying to buy certainly local products, and actually, as it turns out, the local products are the best as far as they go, but they're still nowhere near what I wanted. So I went about to go and build one myself. And we had this, you know, John's Avenue doing that. So, um, where I can, you know, most people are going to say, if I have a high efficiency heat and load, I'm, you know, I'm going to put a 100 kilowatt electric heat in. Please don't. Please, please put tuna before. It doesn't cost much. But, you know, when, when you talk about radiant systems, the cost is in the mechanical area. And we have a solution on the way that will fix, I believe will fix that. And we want, we've got to have this to be very cost competitive. The second thing is that some of those radios are very expensive. But I tell you what, there's a lot of very talented people around here. They can actually build you those radiators. You know, in your, in your 1920 Victorian house or whatever, if you put radiators in the key spots, you could have one of the local guys weld, weld the radiator for you. You know, um, I, I actually go down to Demix quite a bit and have them sandblasted and then powder coated and they're absolutely beautiful. Get creative, I've seen some really funky stuff though, really cool. Um, but we're using, again, we're using water to move heat. Water is absolutely fabulous at moving. We, you know, there are risks of freezing, but we've got, we have technology that watches that now, so we don't have to worry. Really. Okay, so these are, this is a sample. I, I've done probably like, I don't know, 25, 30, 30 of these projects. Um, using this technique, and it took me a while to figure out until I spoke, you know, I heard it from these guys, Albert Michael in particular, go, yes, this is part of what we need, you know. Um, so, this is what I've come up with. Uh, is we can, we can attach anything to it. This is made out of synthetic polypropylene, probably. We may go to nylon, I'm not quite sure yet. But um, here we can take energy from multiple sources, you know, from your solar panels, from your heat store, from your, from your booster, water to water heat pump, and then we pass it out to the, to the remote locations, and we can, we can send out hot water and cooling water as well. So, Actually, what we can have is simultaneous heating and cooling. How cool is that? I mean, you know, um, these, this is called a three level system, and um, this is unique to us. I don't know of anybody else that's doing this. I'm sure the bigger engineer guys have been doing it, but I haven't found anybody yet. And but what makes this different is that we have these little processes driving these valves. And we can get it really accurate and it becomes a finesse proposition. Um, if we have a little weather station, this is not our weather station, but we can attach weather stations, we can monitor electricity, we can do anything we want. And I have a little app here on my mobile phone uh, that you can see it all. And the, um, this is EcoStat and we have a, so what, um, EcoStat is the heart of the system and at the moment we're looking at having a very low cost 
processing, you know, sub thirty, forty dollars. It's it's still a wee bit futuristic, I have to be honest. But we're looking at having a very low cost processor, um, and it runs your house. And then underneath it has sub controllers running your 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 solar array, your heating loops, your your weather station, your everything. And then you take that whole thing and you can make it a community system. And you can share and trade with your neighbors in this little cul-de-sac that I was talking about. Um, we use colors for actually reflecting comfort. So, um, yeah, and this is this little cul-de-sac that I was talking about. So, you could have five different owners, and we have, the transactions will be auditable, so we use bank type processing techniques to, to you know, to, for auditing and so We have a whole security system that lets only people in the group participate, so nobody outside can meet in with it, or, um, and, and your, your mobile phone will work on the same thing. That you could be on the other side of the world, right, you could say, and, and have access to your little, to your house or, 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 as, or to your group. Um, so we have energy sharing and trading. We also have the idea of having common cul-de-sac, like if you live next to a sauna, or, or you had a, you know, by the sea and you could put um, heat plates in, in the sea. Well, we can, we, or we had um, a community solar array, or whatever you want. Um, you know, we, we can set up a community infrastructure, or a district system, as you probably hear. Um, so you could have common ownership and common storage. You might have, you know, you might have one big tank for everybody. Um, this is completely flexible. So, so um, here we have. Um, so you got the idea from of this community sharing perspective. Um, I've actually. Um, I just want to show you quickly that this is a this is a, an imaginary um, community set up in my mind. And that might be frightening to some of you. <laughs> um, um, but um, here we have some greenhouses. These greenhouses are also linked together. After all, a greenhouse is an indoor climate, right? Um, this technology we have runs, makes no distinction. You can go pick what sensors you want to put on, you want to pick what devices you want to put on, and we can we take a reading every minute and we'll optimize how it works for you and it's your in control and you're in charge not PC Hydro uh, and um, and so in this thing that, that, that they can share we might have a boiler, a house boiler um, and it fits beautifully you know with the idea that you know, a high-performance building does need mechanical because you, you need to have um, domestic hot water. You know, what happens when we need to start growing our own food? Um, you, you know, to, it would be a very foolhardy thing to uh, try and put an infrastructure in after you've already built it. You're building it, build it, you know. You're, you're, I promise you, you'll save yourself an awful lot of money. And the, the, the preparations, you know, the costs of the preparations are so tiny relative to, um, you know, by having a bit of foresight and vision. You know, you, you were patting yourself on the back when you ran two pixel, insulated PEX lines to your neighbour, you know, you'll be thinking this is a really good idea. So, um, you know, uh, we're a small company. And, um, well, I think I've already sort of exposed most of the benefits of our technology. It's, we've built it to be very exciting, and that's why I became a plumber, was, you know, to go and find out what's going on in the real world, and, 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 and not be sort of so 
so determined by technology. But if technology is in a submissive role, then I think it's totally fine. Um, we want to have, um, we want to be able to optimize where we collect energy, where we store energy, and where we distribute it on a node by node basis, but also on a community level. And um, we need to allow people to see what's going on in your space. You, know, you need to know right now what's going on. And I, I know still don't see that. There are all sorts of fan dangled systems out there, but I haven't seen one yet that lets you know what's going on in your space, energy wise, comfort wise. Um, and the way we've structured uh, eco standard, it's very, it's very um, modular. So you, you know, it's easy to scale, easy, you know, easy to end. We're, we're still actually in, in development on all of this. But. So I, I, I won't talk too much about more about Kimono. We're a startup company. We're, we're, we're getting going. So, I, I, I've ex expressed a lot, and I, you know, I can see you guys' eyes are blazing over, so I must have got somewhere right. Um, um, so, the first thing is, if, you know, building a house, please take, please take perspective of the passive orientation of the structure, please look at the way the envelope's put together, but please remember, there are only two tools in the box, and there are many others, like the water movement, like the natural airflow, like the humidity modulation, like thermal mass modulation, and there's heat recovery, and all sorts of other things you can do. There's a, there's a very, our toolbox is very full of... Um, please use the energy movement model. If I, if I have heat over there, why move it over there? Don't run it down the drain. Don't, don't, uh, don't heat and then cool and load both of them away. Um, use, you know, have a look at it from a perspective of natural systems. I mean, they've been done for thousands of years. Why, you know, why mess with it? It works extremely well. And I'll save you a lot of money if you're smart about it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we do tend to get caught up in the, if I might say, my, my, on my soapbox, we do get caught up and leave it in the idea that, well, we have to have that heat unit, or we have to have this. You know, I mean, so, some of the things, the ideas that Guy came up with, well, you're going to say, is my house going to be marketable? Well, yeah, but. When you walk into a, uh, a naturally climatized indoor climate, um, you know, if, if somebody's coming to look to buy your house and you take them into the naturally indoor climate, I'd be extraordinarily surprised if you didn't make the sale then and there on the spot. I tell you, you know, I mean, being a plumber, I'm going, I, I, you know, I need, to, I need to sell systems, right? Uh, and the first question you go is, well, have you ever experienced radiant? You know, of course you have. No, you're coming with me, <laughs> you know. And you come around and feel this, and I don't say another word. When can you do it? Um, you, know, you know, the questions completely change. So, um, you know, it, it'll, it'll run itself, eh? and, and there's no reason why we shouldn't have these absolutely wonderful living environments and, um, and they should cost you less or not more. Um, please look at you know, uh, the idea of, of the um, community and local systems and sharing energy because I guarantee you that you know, you'll be they'll put you 20 years ahead of everybody else because by the time we get our green networks and 2035, um, you will have already had it in for 20 years or more plus. <laughs> My mouth's a bit shaky. <laughs> um, 
Um, and um, we, we need to have, you need to see what's going on. And I'm afraid, you know, the current technology doesn't do it very well at the moment. It will, it'll come, and it'll change. But it, it's not doing it very well. Are there any questions? When you mention the cost, how low is the cost? Well, if I want to retrofit the 28 pounds per foot. Well, I think if you do it cleverly, um, you can, it can be less than it. But, you know, it'll be comparable to the FM. I mean, just to give you some idea, um, you're probably getting, say, hex tubing at like 50 cents a foot. Oh, okay. And then I'd buy a good quality one too, but um, it's, you see, where, where Kumar is headed is that we want to have these synthetic, um, we need to have these synthetic mechanical systems, right? Um, and so we, we need to bring the cost down that way. If, if I go and put a custom system in for you, yeah. it's going to cost you another million. Okay. So I'm, I'm not trying to avoid your answer. I'm just saying that under the, under the existing regime, we have to build these elaborate proper networks or use uh, polypropylene or a few other things. Um, you know, in, in our view of the world, we want to have, we want our heating system to be like a computer. You know, when you go buy a computer, it's got a hard drive, it's got a keyboard, it's got a, all the bits of the screen and everything. And you get computing in the package. Well, we want to give you indoor climate control in a package. And, and, and I think once, you know, um, we've, I've developed the technology to do it, um, you know, but we need to, we need to bring it to the market. But this is where we're going. There's something I don't get about Radiant. Um, when you showed us that diagram with the two rooms and one yeah. had, had convection currents showing a different temperature radiance in the room and then you had the Radiant model. Stable, a stable temperature gradient from the bottom to the top, and I don't understand how that gradient is stabilized in the second case because heat and energy naturally moves from warmer areas into colder areas. So how um, do you in, in fluids it does, um, so but, do but radiant energy is completely remember radiant. It's a great question, and it's it's really you know um, the the simple answer is that radiant energy behaves in a completely different way. Okay, so I've got, I've got, a, I've got a cubic meter of air here, and I, I heat this air. Like you say, the, the, um, the warmer air is forced up, and it'll start convecting, as in that picture. What happens with radiant is, it's a line of cycling. It's, radiant has almost nothing to do with air. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, and, and, and it behaves like light. You know, because coming, coming from the sun to the earth, there's a great big vacuum here. And radiant is nature's way of sending energy through low density medium. Right, so you kind of have... So, so when you're putting hot water through the floor, it, it's, it's conducting up to the top of the floor and then it radiates. It, it's got almost nothing to do with the air temperature. So that's, it, it becomes, you know when you have light, uh, you have a candle over there on the table. And you stand right up close to the candle here and you can see a bright light. But as you walk away, it's, it's getting really quickly lighter and lighter. It's a sort of X squared, or 1 over X squared. You know diminishing x squared relationship. And, and radiant's doing exactly that. So it's line of sight, it comes to the edge, it starts behaving like a light. And so it's shooting up. Um, um, and, and so the, but it's a, it, it is also an x squared 
thing, so it's diminishing as it comes up. Believe it or not, I get what you're saying. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, you know, it's really, this is the single hardest thing for people to get. Um, and you've done a great job. Of stuff. I can see that you can't help them. But, <laughs> yeah. But you know, if you experience that, we had friends in Kelowna who had built, this man built his own house in 1956 using hot water heating under a, in a cement and a concrete floor. And that was the most comfortable house that I've ever, ever been in, even in the middle of it. Open up in winter. It was amazingly nice everywhere. But I don't, you know, that's the only time I've ever experienced hot water heating before. It was Actually, you, you know where else you've experienced rain in deep? You experienced it today when you're outside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you also, yeah, you, you also, you, you also experience the converse of that when you go down to the supermarket aisles. Oh, yeah. Right? And you're walking along the supermarket aisle, um, and, um, you, you know, you feel warm, you know, the, the air temperature feels comfortable. You go one aisle over and you're walking past the refrigeration and you're feeling cold or you feel, you feel a chill. What's happening? Uh, radiant energy will go into a life form from your body to the radiant and you, your brain's really like alert to all this stuff. And it's going, I'm losing heat and that's why I feel cold. You go down stairs. Have you ever been in a house in winter where there's no insulation under the slab? And you're going, I can read the temperature on the thermostat and it's 21 degrees Celsius. But I'm freezing. <laughs> you know, I, I can tell I'm in the basement apartment. <laughs> you, know, you know, you wrap up and you know, <laughs> my New Zealand ball is on. Um, yeah, so um, it's the other side of it. Radiance, um, you know, when you're sitting in front of a fire in, in the winter, Oh, in the summer, sorry, you know, roasting, whatever. Um, you know, you feel warm at the front, but cold at the back. The radiant is very much a line of sight thing. It's these little waves of dawn, you know, from mass A to mass B. And the relationship with the air temperature and the radiant is, is so small. It's the only time that there is a relationship between the air temperature and the radiant is when the air comes up against the surface and it actually conducts the heat to the air. The air, remember I just said, is the third the best natural insulator that there is. And um, so using air to move heat. Please people, please, let's have some sanity around here. You know. <laughs> Sir. Water. No, I mean, can do that. But what kind of tool would be a? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, well, a cross grain polyethylene is very good. It's very stable. It picks up the. It's called PEX or cross grain polyethylene. Not but PC. do not, please, do not use PVC. <laughs> PVC is about to be banned. It's highly toxic. It's you know. Um, it's, you know, the, the only thing that's stopping it from being banned is the, the piping industry is, has a huge lobby to stop it. The, the glue is a highly carcinogenic. The, um, um, yeah, so please don't. It's the white Or it can be grey as well. PVC can be grey as well. Because on the internet, everyone that's doing the hydroponic stuff uses PVC. But oh, I'm we sorry. Don't. We and we're putting that into our food. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, use use the materials. Um, Crosslink polyethylene is as good as it comes. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Then you set the flexibility and you can loop it if you want or Yeah, and it's um, somewhat freeze resistant. It's um, there's a user PEX A. There's three categories of PEX. User PEX A. Always use a PEX A. But it's a great question. Really good question. Hi. You know, you're talking about that old house with the 1920s. 
Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Oh, you have the old radios? Yeah. I don't find it um, all that good. I mean, we have to, you know, do more with the insulation and that, but is there, a, like, something better to use than those old radiators? Uh, I haven't seen the house, but I would, I would hazard a guess that this is what's going on. Um, that your, the way the flow system for the valves is not working. Either, what is it, too cold? Yeah, yeah. And yet the thermostat, I mean, there's only one thermostat here. Yeah, you see, what happened in the old days with the radiators is they stuck them in, in a series, in a line. So the, the hot water would go into the first one, heat, and then cooler water would come out to the next one, and you get less heat, and then it goes to the third one, and you get less heat. And they figured out other systems. But if you use our system, there's a school in the Nymo that, um, had a, they, they were very aggressive. They were using uh, actually uh, butane, which is you know banned now. But um, um, they had this underfloor system that never ever worked. They tried all sorts of things, and by putting a two-tier multi a, a manifold system in, that was, and and run leaders independently to each of the radiators. Uh, well, that's yeah, right. yeah, that's what you need There's to do. There's only one thing comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you need to, that's called series. You want to run it all in what they call parallel. Oh, okay. So you have a little manifold that controls each, and maybe two if you're really, you know, because of the old house and you don't want to change the wall. Or, but you can, normally with those fabulous old houses, you can actually get the, the leaders through to the. But and you just use pegs. Yeah, use PECs, as I was telling this gentleman oh, okay. here. You, you run these PECs leaders over to those manifolds, it'll work like a tree, I promise you. What's the best boiler? Um, I don't like the idea of boilers. <laughs> oh, okay, if you have a gas boiler, not Yeah, you know, gas is cheap and all that. Um, no. I, 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 what's your solar orientation look like? Well, the other possibility is um, have to get a little water to water heat pump, uh -huh. and so you, so you set the radiators up on a manifold, yeah. and and I, I'd be looking to get away from using a boiler. Well, I really like to. I mean, we're in the tsunami kill zone, so. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. Um, so you don't want to use water? <laughs> um, yeah, the gas, the gas and water is probably, probably going to be safe. Eh? It does mean, I mean, you're going to have, the gas mains going to be in the street. And actually what they find is that they crack. Eh? But they, lately they've been using a derivative of the POP, the PEX, it's called uh, PE, high density PE. And it's a lot more sort of earthquake and uh, tsunami, I guess, resistant. But um, um, it's the gas when you've got the electric current flashing it to the ground that makes it dangerous. The gas sitting there by itself is probably all right, but it's just when you get a spark. You know. <laughs> um, but but getting away from um, it, it, it is going to take some creativity. You can't, you know. But it is actually probably possible to get away from using gas. I, I would really encourage you to look at it. And, uh, yeah, but, but because you've got an old house and it's probably left and passed away. Yeah, under the cheap 70s pattern, I think it's going to be plastered. <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, it, it, the, the heat retentiveness of that building is probably going to be next to not very high. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I, I would definitely go to a radiator strategy. Uh, you know, modify your, what you got, but keep your old radiator safe. Don't don't chuck your radiator safe. Sure. I you're making me regret my decisions when I bought my house because we were looking at radiators, 
and we didn't, we did baseboards. But uh, if we ever uh, got raided, we have three floors. Uh, the, the main floor, you can get at it pretty easy, so you could do pecs and stuff. You go through the floorboard and stuff. But what about the basement? Like, ooh, yeah. Do you have to do the bottom basement in order to get. How, how much can you raise the floor? <sighs> uh, it's probably. Uh, it's probably a six foot height now, so you could probably raise it a few inches. One technique that you might try. This is a great question, and I, I guarantee you at least three people in this room have got this problem. But, but um, what you want to do, well, to build, if you were going to do it to building code, yeah. you would have to put something that's an R value of R12, which is four inches of EPS or styrofoam, right? There is another way, and what you do is you have a thin layer of styrofoam, then you get some um, uh, aluminium foil, but you need an air gap over it so that no dust settles on the aluminium. And what happens is, what, how did I tell you to set, send radiant heat back? Silver, good, 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 we're almost there. <laughs> come with me, come with me. Um, uh, and, and, and what did I tell you about air? It's third. It's the a third of their insulator, excellent. You, you, you guys are good. <laughs> You're really good. Um, um, so on your concrete floor, I put like half an inch of like EPS down, then I put aluminium foil across it. Um, I'd, put, I'd put your battening on, I'd vacuum the heck out of it, and then I'd put it like a plastic foil over the top of it, then I'd put your floorboard on it. And you'd probably get away with an inch and a bit. Uh, I would put the tubing over the top of the aluminium. Cool. You'd, be, you'd be good cool. to go. Actually, you know, all is not lost. All is not lost. Actually, you've just built a house, right? Yeah. Um, and a great strategy is if you can get leaders across, I, I'm sorry, you may have to cut some little squares of sheetrock out, but if you can get the leaders across, put radiators in. Yeah. But, but don't, don't go and buy the expensive $800 ones. Just you know, there's a guy on Mosquiti Island who does absolutely stunning uh, stainless steel work. He's really good. Have him build some radiators for you. Um, yeah, and then just run your leaders and then get a manifold and run the water to each radiator. You'll love it, I promise you. Um, I haven't gone into the marriage guidance questions. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of the car talk guys? I just love them. Yeah. What about the car mechanics? Now, what about your wife? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, well, yeah. I, I would encourage you, to, I would say to go test it, and if it's doing what you need it to do, I'd go for it. Well, I've got some experiments, and I, I can't make an OHA show, and I'm going to be putting your system into my feet bus for the winter. Well, I, I would have a look at another possibility, uh, is get a small, small water from the heat pump, and, you know, pull the heat off, you know, it could be all sorts of things around your place. Well, that, 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 yeah, and that, then you could have, you know, you run the domestic hot water off it. And, so. Because the heat pump thing is, you know, when it comes to, you, you have two problems. The, the, the first is, where am, I, where am I accumulating the energy from? But, but um, once you've got that sorted out, you've got this heat pump sitting there. It, it, it's, You'd be, in any house, you'd be crazy not to put some sort of water to water heat pump in. The air one's a problem because you, you, you're trying to heat air and natural insulin. I, I would have a look at that sort of type. And then, then you know, you know I, I heard down at the post office that they've got some radiators down there. Go and grab those. You know, have them sand blasted and powder coated and look beautiful. You'll have the best heat. Totally the best heat. For the greenhouse group, I was thinking the story of these uh, big black plastic drums filled with water and a couple of stone. Yeah. So if I put in uh, some body piping and I do a, a circulatory system, then I can have it go through there and have it keep the heat in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or Actually, there's a very interesting example in Taipei in Taiwan where they built a whole building out of polyethylene drinking bottles. So they got, they, got these, they got these polyethylene bottles, they stuck them in a press and they made them into a hexagonal shape. You know, they just like, and, and then they put a whole lot of these bottles in a great big panel, put two great big bands around it, and the ones that are exposed to the light they let empty, and once, like you're saying, is putting the water in, and gear will love to hear this because of the thermal mass, um, you know, you're putting that in the ground. I think this is a fantastic idea. Um, and then, you know what I would do? In addition to what you just suggested, I would run a tube through the hot water so that you can actually modulate, either pull, pull the energy out of it when there's too much in it, and, or put it back in, you know, you could use it kind of as a heat store, right? Exactly. And, and, and then once you got it out, you could have like a, just a very, very small, like one, one kilowatt, one kilowatt uh, uh, water to water heat pump, and that would be where you collect the energy from, and you could get that up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, you could use it for all sorts of things. <laughs> but you need a control system. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> it's obvious when you get two real passionate people about things like this, you go all night long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here.